In the great formative period of the United States, over two centuries ago, the American Founding Fathers became acutely aware that all mankind is seeking the same three things, freedom, prosperity, and peace. They set out to find a system of government that would provide these things for the people of America. Unfortunately, in their day, there was no such government. Therefore, they determined to invent one. This is their story. As we shall see, the search for the ancient principles of sound government was a prolonged and painful one. What was worse, when they finally discovered what these principles were, it was difficult to persuade many people to accept them. Getting people to assume their responsibilities of freedom and self-government was one of the most discouraging parts of their political adventure. The structuring of the American success formula for freedom, prosperity, and peace was a hard-won achievement. Nevertheless, it did finally produce in America the first free people in modern times. That is why this course is so important. The founders laid the foundation for us. We must preserve it. To do so, we must know their success formula well. Now in the few hours that we have together, it will not result in you gaining a complete understanding of the American principles, but our time is intended to put fire in your bones. And we hope that this time will give you a stronger desire to preserve our liberty by learning more about how exceptional our system of government is and encourage you to go forth and exercise your civic authority. I'm Bill Norton. Welcome to the Making of America. Mr. Chairman, the Articles of Confederation now dissolve this convention. The national government ought to be established and set to this Constitution. We begin our day with Lesson 1, Settling the New World. In order to appreciate the historical setting of the making of America, we need to review some of the little-known forgotten events that led to the discovery and the development of the Western Hemisphere. The Founding Fathers would probably consider this one of the most important parts of our study because it covers the tempestuous historical period that gave birth to the great American heritage. Our study of American government begins with an appreciation of the struggle our Founding Fathers went through to discover the ingredients necessary to establish the first free people in modern times. Beginning with the important documents that helped restore the rights of the Anglo-Saxon people lost in the mid-5th century, to the first written constitution penned by Thomas Hooker, we learned the importance of a written law to protect the people from tyranny. You will also become familiar with the early settlements of America beginning with Jamestown and reaching its apex 180 years later with the writing of the Constitution and how their trials and errors led our nation to the discovery of principles that allowed mankind to progress further in 200 years than in the 5,000 years previous. So we're going to begin, first of all, we're going to go throughout the day using this seminar guide. So each of you should have a seminar guide, right? <clears throat> now, if you were to just sit and listen to me all day long, then do you know how much you'd remember about two weeks from now? People who study this kind of thing say that you remember about 2%. Now, if you don't believe me, remember that great sermon that you heard in church about two weeks ago? Remember how moving it was and inspiring? Now, give me some details. You kind of have a hard time, right? Because you kind of forget the details on these things. So what do you know that you need to do in order to remember a little bit more? Write it down. We take notes. That's right. Write it down. Now, I'm guessing that a few of you are a little out of practice taking notes. So we've given you your notes right here in this great seminar guide. But you'll notice as you go through it that we haven't given you all of your notes. You'll notice there's some blanks and things periodically. And so as we go throughout the day, I'm not going to read through much of this. I'm going to do most of it in my own words. But as we go through the different sections and things, I'll give you those blanks. So you don't need to worry about trying to figure them out or anything. I'll just tell you exactly this is blank for letter A, blank for number uh, number two or whatever, and then you'll just fill that out. Now, if you do that, then people who study this kind of thing, if you follow right along with me by filling in those blanks, they say that you can remember between 60 and 70%. So that's a huge increase from that 2% if you just sit and listen. Now, has anybody discovered our little secret? Huh? Nobody? Well, that's good because the students that usually discover this secret, boy, it tells us a little bit about them. But on the back, you'll notice the answers. <laughs> Now, I tell you that those answers are there with a little bit of hesitation because I don't want you flipping back and forth and kind of filling it out because it defeats the purpose of, of staying right with me. 
Um, but I do tell you that because if you miss a blank or if we skip something or I fail to tell you whatever, don't worry. When you get home, you can just fill that blank out because sometimes people just can't stand leaving a blank blank. And so the answers are there uh, for you to be able to, to do that. So we're going to go throughout the day using this uh, seminar guide. And so I hope all of you have that and are, are prepared to, uh, to do that. How many of you have been to Boston? All right, a handful of you, right? Did you take the Freedom Trail when you were in Boston? Right, that, that red painted line or the red inlaid brick that, that goes all through town, the old town Boston, you follow that, a self-guided tour, and you can see all these great historical sites in Boston. Now, if you start on one end of the Freedom Trail, you'll begin at Breed's Hill, where the Battle of Bunker Hill took place, where over 1,000 British soldiers were killed and only a little over 400 American soldiers. Nevertheless, the British took the hill, but that became the first major battle of the American Revolution. And then you go down, you follow that, that Freedom Trail, you'll go across the bridge, and one of the first uh, places you'll come to is the Old North Church. Now, that's the old church where the famous two lanterns hung, indicating that the British would be leaving by water rather than by land. And then if you go down the road a little bit further, you'll come to Paul Revere's home. Now, when Paul Revere moved into that home, it was already about 100 years old. And so this is a great old place to, to see how Paul Revere lived, and it's one of the only old homes left in downtown old Boston. And then you go a little bit further, and there's a number of cemeteries along the way. There's one cemetery that's very fascinating, and that's the old Granary Cemetery. And as soon as you walk in and you take a right, and one of the first stones you'll come to is that of Samuel Adams, father of the American Revolution. And then you go a little further, and you'll see Paul Revere where he's buried. And then uh, right in the middle, there's a big obelisk for the Franklins, not Benjamin Franklin, but Franklin's parents. Benjamin Franklin was just born and baptized right across the street. And then you'll go uh, down the path a little further, and there's another big obelisk for John Hancock. He was always a pretty boisterous, flamboyant person, so of course he'd have a very large uh, stone there. And then there's a, a group of stones off to the side, and it's the Goose family. And there's one stone of particular interest, Mary Elizabeth Goose. Has anybody ever heard of Mary Elizabeth Goose? Now see, this is Mother Goose. I didn't even know such a person exists, but I guess somebody had to write down those stories. Now, some people say maybe that's not her or whatever, but it's fun to, to, to go and see this grave. And tell your kids this is where Mother Goose uh, is buried. Now, once you get done with the Granary Cemetery, just right down the road is the Old South Church. Now, the Old South Church in the 1700s was the tallest and largest building in all of Boston. Now it sits quietly nestled among the towering skyscrapers of busy urban life. But at this time, it was the largest building in all of Boston. And in 1746, during what came to be known as King George's War, France has sent a fleet of nearly 100 ships to burn the coastal cities of America. The colonists were quite concerned about this because they didn't have the armament and the manpower and the ships and things that they needed to fight off this large armada. And so they were quite concerned. So they turned to the only weapon that they had, a weapon that they had to turn to quite often. And the governor of, of Massachusetts declared a universal day of fasting and prayer. And on the appointed day, the colonists in Boston gathered together at the Old South Church. And in a standing room only, people gathered on the inside looking through the windows, thousands of people there. And Reverend uh, Thomas Prince, it was his turn to officiate at that high pulpit of the Old South Church. And he began to pray, prayed before thousands. He said, oh, God, and he began to tell God the situation, as if you have to tell God the situation, right? But that's what we do during prayer. We say, this is what's happening to us, and please help us. And so that's what Reverend Prince did. Oh, God, we have these ships that are coming. We ask thee to raise thy right hand and scatter the ships of our tormentors and drive them hence. Sink those proud frigates to the bottom of thy deep. And he went on to pray like this for quite some time. Some journal entries say that he went on to pray like this for over an hour. And all of a sudden... The room began to darken, and the shutters began a violent hammering against the walls, and the bell atop the tower of the old church began to ring erratically. And Reverend Prince paused for a moment, and then he looked up, raised his hands high above his head. We hear thee, we hear thee, God, we hear thee. Thy hand is raised from the eastward, and thy wind is sinking the ships of our tormentors. Thy bell tolls for the death of our enemies, he said. Now, how did he know what was going on? He didn't have a cell phone. Okay, yeah, they're going down. Uh -huh. 
<laughs> no, he just, he just felt that God was answering their prayers. And sure enough, about a week, week and a half later, news came that a virtual hurricane had risen out of the Atlantic and had sunk in nearly every one of those French frigates. And those that remained limped back to the West Indies from whence they came. Boston wasn't burned. Charleston wasn't burned. New York wasn't burned. God had once again preserved the colonists from utter destruction. Isn't that a great story? Mm -hmm. What a wonderful story. Our history is riddled with stories just like that. And we used to teach that, those stories to our kids in, in school. They used to be right in our textbooks, stories just like this. But we, we don't have those anymore in those textbooks. And I think we're robbing our youth. We're robbing our youth of history how it really was. History how it was by those who lived it. See, now all we tell our youth is just, we have them memorize names and dates, and it kind of gets boring for them, but you've got to get it to come alive and tell these stories and what they experienced. And the youth love history when, uh, when you do that. Uh, but we're robbing our youth of these great stories. Now, I tell you this story about this event that took place at the Old South Church that sets on the Freedom Trail, because I want you to think of today as a journey down a Freedom Trail, a trail that very few Americans have gone down. We're going to talk about some historical uh, things, and we're going to talk about some principles that we haven't discussed in our society or taught in our schools for about 100 years. Uh, there's going to be some principles that you're going to learn that are very, very enlightening. And these are some of the principles that the Founding Fathers discovered. So this is a very exciting journey, this journey down this freedom trail that we're going to go through. So we're going to begin now uh, in your book. We'll start here on, uh, on page 5. Now there's a couple uh, of bits of terminology you need to become familiar with. Uh, we like to boil things right down to their, to their simplest form, so they're easiest to understand, right down to their natural law principles. And when you boil society down uh, to its simplest form, there's basically two types of law. There's Roman civil law, which we'll call ruler's law. So that's your first blank on page five, ruler's law. Now, who makes the law under ruler's law? The ruler. The ruler. See, we like these self-evident, boil it right down to, to simple truths, easy to figure out. Ruler's law, that's right. Then the other type of law is what we would call English common law or, rule, or uh, people's law, rather. People's is your next blank. And where does the law come from under people's law? From the people. That's right. Now, so we've got these two types of law, and if you... If you Take any type of government, you can, you can place them into one of these two categories. It's either ruler's law or it's people's law. Now, what was the first major nation that came in and uh, settled, began settling the American uh, continent? North America. Spanish. That's right, the Spanish came in, right? So the Spanish came in, and they kept themselves very preoccupied uh, down in South and Central America, southern part of the United States, Florida. And what was it that kept them preoccupied? Gold, gold and silver. silver. That's right. So they were very busy collecting all this gold and silver and, and trying to, uh, to uh, increase their wealth, which they did considerably. And then what was the next major nation that came in to explore the heartland of America? France. The French. That's right. The French came in, and they began exploring that heartland. Now, what kind of law did the French bring with them? Ruler's law, right? Ruler's law. And what kind of law did the Spanish bring with them? Ruler's law. So you have two ruler's law nations butting heads against each other. And as they were kind of butting heads, they left a nice pocket on the eastern seaboard for what nation? England. England. That's right. So England was able to come in and settle three million, your next blank, three million English freemen by 1776. Anybody have any idea what the population of uh, England was? Well, I should say the British uh, Empire was at this time. It's about 12 million, right? about 12 million. So we represented about 25% of the English population. That's why when we uh, put forth the non-importation uh, resolution, which was basically a recommendation that we stop dealing with British merchants, that almost bankrupted London because we represented such a large percentage of the English population. That's why uh, separation, independence, was a pretty significant thing because England was going to lose a large percentage of their population. But nevertheless, the uh, English were able to come in and settle, and they brought with them people's law. Now, they did have some forms of ruler's law with them as well, but people's is your next blank there, people's. <clears throat> now, 
the question is, where did they get it? Because here you have uh, France and Spain, these are two European countries, and they came and they had rulers law. So where did the English get uh, people's law? Well, the answer is on the next page. The, they, it came from the basic institutions of government from the Anglo-Saxons, which is your next blank on the top of page six, Anglo-Saxons. They got it from their ancestors. That seems reasonable, right? <clears throat> So a very brief history of the Anglo-Saxon people. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more in detail about them later. But basically what happened is you had two brothers, Hengist and Horsa. And they were invited to the island of Britain by the king of Kent. Now Kent was a Celt, and he was fighting some other Celts. And he knew of these big, strong warriors on the mainland. And so he invited them to come and help him fight uh, in his wars. And so Hengist and Horsa, these two Saxon chiefs, came and they brought their families and they brought their warriors. And that's kind of the way that, that uh, the Anglo-Saxons, Vikings and things did that. A lot of times they'd bring their whole uh, families and th stuff with them as they would uh, go on their conquests. And so that's what they did in this case. And they liked England. They thought this was a, this is the island of Britain was a great place. So they decided to stay. King of Kent didn't like it very much, but, you know, he invited these big, strong warriors that are able to conquer, and so he really didn't have much uh, to say about it when they decided to stay. And so the land of England uh, became referred to as Engels land, which is what uh, the Anglo-Saxons referred to as Engels. And so Engels land, or as we pronounce it today, England. And so this is what, how they came there in about 450 A.D. Now, they lived in, in uh, they brought with them a great system of government, and they lived very, very peacefully for about 600 years. In fact, there were times when Kent had zero crime and zero poverty. Until that great hook date in history, 1066. What happened in 1066? William the Conqueror. William the Conqueror, that's right. Norman Conquest, okay? And that's when <clears throat> William the Conqueror came in, and they brought in uh, Roman civil law, feudal law, and they corrupted, your next blank, corrupted the Anglo-Saxon system of government. See, the problem was, is that the Anglo-Saxons didn't write their law down. That was the one weakness that they had. But they didn't think they had to write it down. Because to them, it was just common sense. Or as we say, it was self-evident. Or how would the youth say it today? It's a no-brainer, right? It's a no-brainer. And so here it is. To them, it's a no-brainer that if you, if you uh, cultivate your field and you till it up and you plant your seed and you, you uh, take care of it and nurture it and whatever you reap, right, um, is, is yours because you sowed it. Your labor went into it, and so it was your property. And you had the total right and control of that property. To them, it's a no-brainer. And I think the Anglo-Saxons, I think their problem was they didn't realize that politicians don't have brains. <laughs> and so you've got to write it down. And that's the one thing that they discovered. You've got to write it down. And so what happened is Normans came in, and they were able to corrupt their system of government because they didn't have a formal written system of government. Now, under letter C, you'll see this great quote from Thomas Jefferson describing how the Normans uh, induced their feudalism into uh, England. He said, Our Saxon ancestors held their lands as they did their personal property in absolute dominion who by persuasions or threats were induced to surrender them. For that purpose, a general principle was introduced that all lands in England were held by the crown. Now, this is an interesting point. I like to, to highlight it because this shows us exactly how you conquer or enslave a people. And what do you do? Take away their private property rights. Right? That's how you conquer them. That's how you enslave them. That's how you bring them into bondage. Right? And we're going to talk in detail a little bit later on on property. Property is my personal favorite um, principle of the, uh, within the principles of liberty. So we're going to go into some detail and, and really do some exciting stuff. So, so take away their private property rights. That's the way that you, you uh, capture uh, people. Now, what ended up happening uh, over the next couple hundred years is some of the same uh, barons and earls and things that actually helped support that Norman conquest, uh, they began to get a little frustrated because the king started abusing their rights. See, they were perfectly fine when it came to abusing the rights of the peasants and that lower class. But now when their rights started being abused, they got a little upset. So in 1215, they took this, this big chart and they decided to write their rights on it. Right? And what do we call that big chart? Magna the Magna Carta. That's right. That's exactly what that means. Magna is big. Carta is chart. And so the Magna Carta, which is your next blank there. 
And they took that chart and they wrote their rights on it and they brought it to the king and they forced the king to sign it. Did he want to sign it? No. He did. A uh, little persuasion, a little sword to the throat. Um, and so he eventually signed it. Did he follow it? No, he didn't follow it. So basically what the, uh, the, the, the barons and the earls and things ended up doing is they, they decided, you know, we're going to appoint some of our best and brightest uh, among us to go and be with the king. Just kind of surround the king and remind him of the, uh, those rights that are listed in the Magna Carta. And this became one of the earliest forms of the first English parliament. Parliament is your next blank. Parliament. Now, this kind of worked a little bit. It kind of helped uh, keep the king in line. The king got a little upset about it, but, uh, but he eventually used parliament uh, a lot of times to his advantage. Um, but then we have, uh, in the 1600s, we have an English jurist or a judge by the name of Sir Edward Cook. Now, you'll notice in your book it's spelled Coke, but it's pronounced Cook. Now, Sir Edward Cook was abusing the rights of the Anglo-Saxon people. Uh, he was basically only applying the principles in the Magna Carta to the uh, upper class until he began uh, kind of contemplating that a little bit and he realized that that was incorrect, that the rights that are set forth in the Magna Carta are not just for the barons and the earls and things, but were for every English freeman. Freeman is your next blank there, freeman. But by 1628, Charles I became very, very harsh and so Parliament forced him to sign the Petition of Rights, which is your next blank under letter G, Petition of Rights. And he continued to be pretty harsh, and so finally, uh, Parliament turned control over to Oliver Cromwell. Cromwell was a fantastic man. He was a great military man, very honorable, a lot of integrity, and so they decided to turn a tremendous amount of rights over to him, and this great man was only great until he had all these powers. <laughs> and then uh, he became corrupted, absolutely became corrupted. And so we start seeing what happens when we turn things over. We also start seeing what society does. When society is having a very difficult time uh, and there's a lot of turmoil and there's a lot of uh, unsure things with our economy and whatnot, uh, it, it, it is the tendency of society to turn a tremendous amount of power over to a very small group of people. And every single time in history that has been to the detriment uh, of the freedom of the people. They always turn into tyrants. There are very few occasions in which uh, that hasn't happened. Um, so Charles I ended up being convicted and uh, beheaded. And then in 1600, Charles II was put on the throne and then when he uh, died, his brother James was put on the throne as James II. And uh, he became so ruthless that they overthrew him in what we call the Glorious Revolution. Right? The Glorious Revolution. And then Parliament said nobody can ascend to the throne of England unless they first agree to sign the English Bill of Rights, which is your next blank, Bill of Rights. So that's exactly what William and Mary, Mary was the uh, daughter of James II, and William and Mary agreed to sign it. They were actually in exile because their uh, dad had just had his head cut off. <laughs> well, James II hadn't, but, uh, but they knew what was happening. The uh, they, they parliament kind of gets, gets a little ruthless with these kings that are tyrants. And so they were in exile in Holland. Now, interestingly enough, there was another person in Holland uh, that was there, and he came back uh, on the same ship. Now, this person uh, was John Locke. Now, the reason why he was in Holland is kind of interesting. There's another individual by the name of Algernon Sidney. Now, Algernon Sidney went around and he started talking about how there's no such thing as the divine right of kings. Now, this is a doctrine in which people believe that there are certain people among us that are divinely appointed and born with the privilege of the right to automatically govern others. Okay? the divine right of kings. And King James was writing about how there is the divine right of kings because, of course, he felt like he was the one divinely appointed to govern all the rest of us. And so uh, Algernon Sidney began saying, no, 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 there's no such thing as divine right of kings. Uh, King James didn't like that very much, and so he had Algernon Sidney beheaded. Well, John Locke wanted to say the same things, but he went to Holland so he could say it from a safer distance. <laughs> <laughs> and John Locke went a little further. He said, you know, not only are we born with the right to govern this, and we're the only ones that are born with the right to govern this, but everything that we do with this, our labor, 
turns into an extension of this, and so therefore everything we do with this body um, becomes an extension of this body, so therefore we have the right to totally govern that as well. And nobody else is born with the right to govern those things except for us as individuals. And so he began uh, really writing about this and talking a lot about it. John Locke was one of the most um, quoted and most read uh, philosophers of the founders. Um, Anybody know what the most quoted book was among the founders? The Bible was, that's right. Um, A number of years ago, there was some research done uh, with all these quotes from the founders, and they looked at where all the sources came from, and the Bible was well over 50% of the sources, um, and then John Locke was, was almost right next in line. So John Locke was very significant to the founders. Anyway, John Locke actually helped orchestrate that glorious revolution. And um, so, he, uh, so then he, he ended up being on that same ship to come back uh, to England once that revolution had, had taken place. Now, these hard-won rights came by a lot of sacrifice, a lot of, uh, a lot of suffering, a lot of death. Um, in fact, this, this conflict between the Anglo-Saxon people and the Norman kings uh, went on for hundreds of years. And uh, we have stories and legends and things like that, and we make movies about them today. What, any, anybody think about some stories about the conflict between Anglo-Saxon people and the Norman kings? Robin Hood. Robin Hood. Robin Hood's a great example. Um, Robin Hood, we don't know whether or not he exists. Um, he, he, we've actually, it looks like history, when you go through it, it seems like he's probably a conglomerate of a number of different inv- individuals. Uh, but yeah, Robin Hood is, totally represents the Anglo-Saxons. Uh, it wasn't about stealing from the rich, giving to the poor. It was about regaining their rights, especially their property rights, and giving it back to the Anglo-Saxon people from these Norman kings. And so that's really the, the story or legend of Robin Hood, that that's exactly uh, a great example. Or Ivanhoe is another example. Some people um, will, will say Braveheart. Now, Braveheart's similar, but it's the Celts fighting against the Norman kings, not the Anglo-Saxons against the Norman kings, but the same kind of thing. Now, I think uh, you know, many of us today kind of take this, this, this battle that these Anglo-Saxons went through for granted. How many of you have ancestry in England? Right. A handful of you? Okay. Now, if they could come back and talk to you today, what do you think their message would be? I think they'd, they'd tell you a couple different things. First of all, you've got to write it down. You see, that's what, we, that's what we just, we went through that very fast history of England to, to show us that we need to start writing things down. Magna Carta, Petition of Rights, English Bill of Rights, got to start writing things down. Got to tell government what our rights are, what they can and can't do. So I think that's the first thing they would, that they would say. I think the next thing they would say is don't let it happen. Don't let what happened to us happen to you. Once you lose your freedoms, it is very, very difficult to get it back. Right? Isn't it? Extremely hard. And we've kind of learned that, haven't we? Right? What happened about three, three and a half years ago? People woke up. They looked around. You know, and and a lot of times the media and and things kind of indicate that that this whole liberty movement right now uh, began as a result of the current administration, uh, the Obama presidency. But it didn't. If you kind of look back, it actually began at the end of George Bush's presidency with, uh, primarily, it was with the fiscal responsibility issues. Um, It was the bailout that everybody was so upset about. Um, And so that's kind of when the movement got its start. And then when President uh, uh, Obama took place, or took office, uh, he just continued on with those exact same policies when it came to the bailouts, the bank bailouts and things like that. So people got very upset about it. And so people woke up and they looked around and they thought, you know, th- we're not quite as free as our grandparents told us that we were. Kind of discovered that we, we had lost a lot of freedoms. And the people thought, well, no big deal. We'll just, we'll just tell our government, we'll tell Congress that we want our freedoms back. How have they responded? They haven't. Not very well. well. The same way governments always respond when we want to take our freedom back. Um, Suddenly, their number one response, which is quite interesting, um, what did the president say early on in the movement? He said, um, you think they would come here to thank me? Right Now, I find that interesting because, because, you know, King George said the exact same thing. That one of the reasons why King George was upset was because he was taxing uh, the the colonists and they were just putting these taxes on the... the, uh, American people, without their consent, without them being able to decide how to be taxed, to help pay for his wars, and primarily the French and Indian War. 
King George thought, well, the war was fought mostly in America, and so the Americans should pay for it. And the, the Americans are like, we're fine with that, but just let us have a little bit of say over how we're going to pay for it, how we're going to be taxed, how much we're going to be taxed, but, but we'll pay for it. And King George said, how dare you question? You should be thanking me, basically is what he said. I protected you. You protected us. That was your war. We fought on our soil and spilt our blood. So you see, we started getting a little upset. And King George again starts getting upset because, well, but we protected you all along and we've given you so much. How can you be so ungrateful? And that's kind of how our government is acting today, Congress and and, well, all levels of government, quite frankly, as we're trying to get our freedoms back, they're saying, but we were here to protect you and take care of you. How can you possibly be upset about that? So we see the same things happening in history over and over, regardless of who's in office. Um, and so it's, it's quite interesting. But I think that's exactly what the founding fathers, or, or not the founding fathers, but the Anglo-Saxon ancestors would say, don't let it happen. Don't let what happened to us happen to you. When you lose your freedom, it's very difficult to get it back. See, we started at 1066, and now English Bill of Rights was written in 1689. 600 years, and they still had only gotten a very, very small percentage of their freedoms back that they had prior to the Norman Conquest. So a great lesson to learn. So let's not lose any more freedoms. That's exactly what uh, we're here today is to learn about the Constitution and about your freedoms and learn how to protect those. Um, because government is absolutely necessary. Uh, it's just up to us to learn our role in protecting our freedoms within uh, the government. So we're going to backtrack a little bit with Queen Elizabeth in, in uh, 1585. Now, she wanted to head off the Spanish settlement in America, and so she sent Sir Walter Raleigh uh, to America to begin uh, establishing a couple of settlements. He established two, and both of them failed. Uh, and he lost over $200,000 of his own money. Now, in uh, 1585, 86, that's a lot of money, $200,000. And uh, so he lost all that. So then what ended up happening is in 1607, we find the first permanent settlement, first permanent English settlement in America. And what settlement was that? Jamestown. Jamestown, that's right. Jamestown basically was established by a group of English businessmen who wanted to come to America to... to uh, take advantage of some of the great resources that were here. And so they came and they, they contracted with King James to come to America and establish the settlement. Well, this group of English businessmen knew of these other settlements that had failed. And so they wanted to really make sure they kind of wrapped their arms around this, their situation and kind of micromanage it a little bit. So what they decided is they said, okay, once you get there, we're going to appoint a leader no private property, none of this dog-eat-dog -dog stuff, right? And you'll do as you're told. What kind of government is that? Appoint a leader, no private property, do as you're told. Communism. communism. That's right. And this isn't the, the harsh authoritarian communism that we see in, in the you know, early 1900s. Uh, this is just simply communal living. So communism is your next blank there. Communism under letter B. How well did this work out for them? Not very well. They almost didn't become the first permanent English settlement in America. Uh, and they almost starved to death. And they would have starved to death unless they changed their system. And eventually, after a number of years, they did change their system. And they got rid of this uh, communal living approach. Now, we know a whole lot more about the next group of people that came in 1620. Right? This is the pilgrims. And the reason why we know so much more about them is because of William Bradford. William Bradford sometimes is referred to as the father of American history because he kept such detailed journals, and he wrote one of the very first American history uh, uh, books. And so William Bradford, we know a lot about him. Now, basically, the pilgrims were essentially sponsored by pretty much the same group of English businessmen. And you had half the group were pilgrims. The other half the group were, uh, were representatives of the business. And so... You had kind of this uh, confliction there with these, this, these two separate communities. And so, again, these English businessmen, they thought, you know, we, we still want to have our arms wrapped around this situation. So what they told them is, you're, we're going to appoint a leader, no private property, do as you're told. Now, why would they make the same mistake twice? Who were the pilgrims? What kind of people were they? Religious. They were religious. So they figured they can make it work. They're Christians, right? Brotherly love, all things in common. 
And so they established what we might call a form of Christian communism. Christian is your next blank. And they figured they could make that work. Well, how well did that work out for them? Not very well at all. When they first got there, things were kind of exciting. Things went okay at the very beginning. Uh, and they, they were pretty excited about the fact that they were in this new world and they got away from the Church of England because that's really what they were trying to get away from. And uh, so they were pretty, pretty pumped about it. But things changed very quickly. In fact, you mothers, how many times have you prepared those job charts for the kids? <laughs> right? How long do those last? Weeks, maybe a couple months, right? Not too long. Because then the complaints start coming in. Oh, Johnny has more work than me, or I can't do this, or we didn't change it, whatever the complaints are. Well, that's exactly what William Bradford discovered. Oh, the complaints start coming in. Oh, my elbow hurts, my back aches, I can't go out and work in the fields. And interesting, he writes down about how the women were complaining about having to prepare the meat for all of the men in the village. You know, and you can imagine their same complaint would be on the, washing the dirty socks. You know, it's bad enough washing the dirty socks of our husbands and sons, but for the whole village? This is a stinky job, right? And so people started complaining. Now, the other thing that William Bradford discovered is that those who had the most complaints were the first ones in line with the largest baskets at time of harvest. So I thought, that's interesting. Those with the most complaints were the first ones to expect something uh, in return or something from society. So William Bradford gathered everybody together. He said, this isn't working. We are absolutely going to fail. In fact, half of them starved that first season. And there was the, almost all their women died. Uh, they only had like three women left after that first winter. And so William Bradford gathered them all together. This has got to change, he said. He said, what we're going to do is we're going to divide up all the land according to the size of your family. We're going to divide up all the tools and the seed corn. And basically, in a nutshell, he said, from here on out, it's root hog or die. We're going to die anyway, he said if we keep up with this system. So we need to change the system. So every man for himself. Now this had amazing results. In fact, if you turn to the top of page 8, you'll see that there's a picture of uh, a Plymouth. This is actually a modern uh, picture of, of Plymouth. If you've never been there, it's a great place to go. You'll go and, uh, and you see all these, the whole village is recreated and people in costume, and they stay in character. They're just not in costume. They're in character. In fact, if you ask them anything that took place after about 1630, they have no idea what you're talking about. And so, for example, like if you go up and ask them, you know, can I take your picture? You know, you might have uh, the woman of the house or something that would say, uh, well, what would you want with my picture? Speaking of her water pitcher sitting up on the mantle. <laughs> and, uh, and so it's a lot of fun for the kids because they just stay right in character. But anyway, William Bradford, in fact, if you go to Plymouth and go find William Bradford, he's walking on the, uh, up and down the streets periodically, and you say, Governor, tell us how you changed the economic system in Plymouth. Oh, he loves to tell the story. They take great pride in Plymouth on how they were the first ones to root out communism and uh, establish a free market system. And here's what he said. This had very good success, for it made all hands very industrious. So as much more corn... You'll notice some uh, interesting old English spelling here. So as much more corn was planted than otherwise would have been, the women now went willingly into the field and took their little ones with them to set corn, which before would allege weakness and inability, whom to have compelled would have been thought great tyranny and oppression. So this was met with great success. And so William Bradford, he writes all this stuff down, keeps track, here's what works, here's what doesn't work, right? What a great... Uh, a debt of gratitude we owe to William Bradford for that. Now, how were they plowing their fields in Jamestown and Plymouth? What were they using? What kind of tool were they using? Just, just a stick plow, right? They, didn't even, they didn't, hadn't even invented that nice plow that gave you these nice beautiful furrows. It was just a stick plow. About the same way that mankind had been plowing their fields for about 5,000 years. Now, they had improved upon it a little bit. They put a little metal tip on the end so it wouldn't wear down quite as fast. But basically the same way that mankind had been plowing their fields for about 5,000 years. Now, what were they using uh, uh, to, uh, for, as transportation? How were they getting around? The animals. Animal power, walking, wind power with their ships. In fact, their ships at this time weren't even as, as large and sophisticated as some of the ancient Phoenician ships. But they were still using the same type of power, right? 
Now, their medicines were made up more of noxious concoctions and superstitions than any kind of science, about the same way that mankind had been living for about 5,000 years. They thought that alcohol was a staple food. Some still think that. <laughs> so about the same way that mankind had been living for 5,000 years. You see this pattern here? Right? Now, what happened as soon as we wrote that constitution and we put it in place? What took place? In less than 200 years, we went from ox cart to space travel. Amazing, the advancement that took place. It was an absolute miracle, in fact. We went further in 200 years than mankind had gone the 5,000 years previous. In fact, we might even say that we made a 5,000-year leap. Right? And there's the title to a book that many of you perhaps are familiar with, The 5,000-Year Leap. Now, The 5,000-Year Leap, that's the title. Dr. Cleon Skousen wrote the book. And the title is, is to express exactly that point, that when you unleash the mind of man, when you institute principles of freedom and liberty, then mankind can go further in 200 years than they went in the 5,000 years previous. Really an amazing thing. And so 5,000-year uh, leap basically goes through all those principles. Whenever anybody asks, you know, I want to learn a little bit more about our government and our history and things, where should I start? This is it. This is the primer. Now, this doesn't talk about the Constitution at all. Uh, in fact, you won't, you won't get any constitutional education here other than the fact that you get the foundation upon which the Constitution was written. And so that's why this is the starting place, because once you learn these principles, then you can actually go through the Constitution rather quickly. In fact, you'll discover that about our course today. You know, this is a course about the Constitution, but yet a large part of it is about history and principles. Because once you know the history, where the founders got their good ideas, and once you know the principles that they discovered, the Constitution is actually rather, rather easy to go through and understand. And so we actually spend more time on the history and principles than the actual document itself. Uh, but we will go through it and, and, uh, and get through most of the Constitution. But The 5,000-Year Leap, fantastic book. Um, it's the one that, that really uh, is the starting point to give you that foundation of these principles that the founders discovered. Do you like principles in your lives? Yeah. 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 Principles are great, right? They help guide you and, and, uh, and direct you, right? And there's all kinds of principles. There's uh, principles of, of, of religion, there's principles of morality, and there's uh, principles of, of science, and there's principles of mathematics. Now, once you start learning the principles of mathematics, you can start knowing and understanding how multiplication works. And you start learning about your multiplication tables. So then you know that 4 times 4 is 16, right? We all good with that? Yes. Everybody in agreement with that? See, everybody knows those principles. <clears throat> and then we know that 8 times 8 is 64. Everybody good with that? Yes. Yeah. And so then we know that 11 times 11 is 121. You're all good with that? Yeah. Yeah, we're pretty good. 12 times 12 is 144. Right? 13 times 13, 169. Well, I lost a couple of you there. <laughs> How about 13, 39 times 39 is 2581? Pretty good at that? I lost all of you on that one. Yeah, sure did. <laughs> you get, you'll trust me on that, though. 39 times 39 is 2581. Yeah. Got a couple of dissenters, a couple of people nodding their heads. Well, thank you for those who, uh, who uh, you know, your confidence and things. You can trust me, you know. <laughs> I teach Sunday school. <laughs> you can touch me. Trust me here. <clears throat> well, I'm sorry, but 39 times 39 is not 2581. That's over 1,000 off. But see, you wouldn't have known that unless you'd have memorized your 39s. And see, that's how you knew all those, those, uh, those lower multiplication tables, because you memorized them, right? You had a smart teacher back in the third grade or so that said, if you memorize these principles of mathematics, it will be a blessing to you the rest of your lives. Has it been? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But obviously, none of you memorized your 39s. <laughs> but isn't that happening in legislative halls all over this country? You have a problem. And a politician stands up and says, 2581. And we're looking at it, 39 times 39, there's two nines there and an 81 there. Okay, I buy it. You know, you don't do your complete research, but it sounds good. He presents it really well. In fact, a lot of times the politician himself believes it. And so they, they, they sound very convincing. This is a great new idea. Well, it's the wrong answer. And see, that's the great thing that we have with the 180-year period from Jamestown to that Constitution is we have this period of trial and error where they wrote it down. 
Here's what works. Here's what doesn't work. Just like William Bradford, this was met with great success. Do you know something that they wrote down in the 1600s? Don't ever try to tax the income of the people. Oh, it's just miserable. You have to meddle in their affairs way too much. You'll make liars of the people. It just is very difficult. It's very unfair. It will always be out of balance. Don't you wish we'd go back and read some of these writings? They wrote it down. They kept track of it. They tell us what the right answer is. They learn from, from experience. And so the same thing, we come out here and we hear this answer, 2581, and this politician might think it's a great, wonderful, new idea. It's not a wonderful, new idea. It's just an old, bad idea. It's still the wrong answer, regardless of how it's framed, regardless of how it's tried, regardless of how it's put in char- whoever's put in charge. In fact, you'll notice that a lot of times whenever a bad answer comes up, and they say, oh, but, but this time it will work because we're going to put these people in charge of it. It's not because of the people. It's because it's just simply the wrong answer. It's not 2581, okay? So very important to know those principles. Now, how would you like, just like your multiplication tables, you, you're able to memorize those, how would you like a very short list of principles that you could easily memorize that tells you uh, the principles of good government? So you could immediately recognize whether or not 2581 was the right answer or the wrong answer. Would you like a set of principles like that? Yes. Yes. Thanks for asking. Because we have them here. And that's exactly what's in uh, the 5,000-year leap. There are 28 fundamental principles of liberty. And you go right through those principles, and they'll build on each other. It starts right with, uh, with natural law, and it starts building on it. It talks about the uh, importance of, of being a moral people, and then it gets right into checks and balances and separation of powers and strong families, and it gets into all those principles that the founding fathers discovered and uh, put into our society. Now, the problem was, is they put it in all their writings. They never listed it out for us. See, back then, they didn't just turn on the TV. You read an article. You read, you read uh, a book or whatever. And so that's where all this was. So Dr. Skousen went through uh, hundreds of volumes, thousands of documents, and grabbed out all these principles and put it in one single volume for you to read. So there's 28 fundamental principles. Now, how many issues are there today? to be concerned with? Hundreds? Thousands? A lot? (laughs) 16 trillion issues? (laughs) Absolutely. There's There's a lot of them. Now, if you really wanted to wrap your arms around uh, some issues and know them and and really uh, understand them and help make a difference in them, how many do you think you could tackle? Three to five. Three to five if you're a political junkie, maybe one or two if you're a normal citizen, if you're lucky, right? And even that's going to be very time consuming. So it's very difficult to know all of these hundreds or even thousands of issues. You've got to know uh, the background behind them, the people behind them. You've got to understand uh, who's voting for it, who's against it. You've got to know just just all these little details. Well, wouldn't it be much easier to simply learn 28 fundamental principles that whenever an issue or a law or something comes up, you can plug them into those principles and out comes the result, right? It's great. And so that we're going around this country trying to encourage people to learn, become familiar with, and ideally to memorize these 28 fundamental principles of liberty. So then what will end up happening is you'll end up being uh, out talking with your neighbor. And, uh, well, first of all, my guess is that because you're here coming to learn about the Constitution and how to be a more active citizen and things like that, my guess is that you're the type of people that when your friends and family see you coming, they turn the other direction, right? Because they know you're going to beat them up about this issue or that issue or this candidate or that issue. You've got something to, for them to sign, petitions, whatever, okay? And so you've got to change that. Uh, people, people, most uh, people, citizens, Americans, are kind of turned off by these, these issues and, and parties that are battling against each other. And it's just people just don't like politics because it's a, it's a dirty, rotten, filthy business. And so... You can start teaching them principles, and you'll notice a very different uh, reaction. So you'll be out talking with one of your neighbors, and you'll be uh, you know, leaning against a shovel. You're out working in the yard, and uh, your neighbor's going to say, you know, what do you think about what so-and-so is proposing? And you're going to say, that's pretty good. Sounds really compassionate and uh, seems like a good thing for those people, but it violates a fundamental principle of good government, that the proper role of government is to protect equal rights, not provide equal things. Now, you see, you just quoted principle number seven, but your neighbor's not going to know that. What's going to happen? They're going to take a step back, and they're going to say, wow, 
you're pretty smart. <laughs> okay, now you've got to be humble when you know this much, folks. Okay? <laughs> it's not much to know, but it's a lot more than your neighbor knows. Right? And so what's going to happen? About two, three days before an election, you're going to get a phone call from that neighbor. You know, I've been real busy. Things are crazy at work. Had this family issue. I haven't had a chance to study the issues of the candidates, but I know you have. So tell me a little bit. You know, I'm not going to vote exactly how you're going to vote, but tell me a little bit about them. Now, whenever I get these phone calls, I'll ask the people, do you want to just know how to vote or do you want the background behind it? And every once in a while, people will say, just tell me how to vote. And that's fine, whatever. At least you're multiplying your vote legally without voting for dead people and things like that. <laughs> <clears throat> but most people want to feel like they've done their civic duty and understand a little bit about it. And so they'll say, you know, give me some details. Now is your opportunity to teach. See, now they're coming to you. Instead of turning the other direction because they don't want to be beat up about an issue, they're now coming to you because they know you understand principles. And that's exactly uh, what we need to do in our society is go back and understand these principles and teach them to each other and hold each other accountable to them. And they're fantastic principles. Uh, in fact, if you go through them, you'll notice that you can apply these principles to every single level of government. Now, we start with the federal government, right? And what, what is the most basic level of government in our society? Family. The family. That's right. The family is the most basic government unit in society. Now, when you boil it down even, even further, what is the most basic unit of government? Individual. Individual. Isn't that what life is all about? It's trying to figure out how to govern this, right? And we are the only ones that really have the right to govern this. <clears throat> and so you'll notice that those principles work all the way down the line. Now, once you get down to the individual, a couple of the principles are a little tricky. Like, don't try the separation of powers. <laughs> Not a pretty thing. But in a family, think about this. The separation of powers checks and balances. Here you have a family, and you have a husband and a wife, equal but separate partners, okay? And they both have great, a great role uh, in this life. Uh, women and mothers and wives, we love you. You're so emotional and so nurturing, and you're just so kind. I, we just love that. But man, sometimes that emotion gets way out of control. So you need us hard, cold, calloused men to come in and check that, okay? But we need you to check, to check us. You see these great checks and balances between husband and wife, equal but separate partners in a family? And so you see these same principles uh, work all the way through every level of government. And so you can not only enjoy these principles in your government, but you can enjoy them in your own lives. In fact, that's really what I think we need to do. I think there's three things that we've got to do in our society. We need to learn these principles. Then, the most difficult thing, we need to live them. That's pretty tough sometimes, especially now. Government is so intertwined in every aspect of our, of our lives, it's very, very difficult to fully be free, uh, but we can be. Uh, we, ca we can, e even in areas that you don't think we can be. Uh, I've got a couple stories along the way that we'll talk about that. So once we learn the principles, live the principles, we then need to teach the principles. See, education is critical if we want to regain our freedoms. In fact, Thomas Jefferson said that the only true corrective to constitutional abuses is education. On another occasion, he said, enlighten the people. Enlighten the people and tyranny and oppression will vanish like evil spirits at the dawn of day. Isn't that a great quote? One of my favorites. Now, Thomas Jefferson knew that we had to be educated if we're going to be free. He even said it another time, if, you, if, if a nation expects to be ignorant and free, it expects what is and what never will be. And so we cannot be free as long as we remain ignorant uh, to these fundamental principles of liberty. So very critical that we, that we understand these. And this is how the people actually rise up against our, our, uh, the tyranny that exists today in our government. Um, one of the great things that we have is this great opportunity to rise up in such a peaceful manner. See, this is a, a way that, that very few citizens of the world throughout history have had that opportunity to rise up in a peaceful manner. In fact, I was uh, teaching a seminar like this a, f a couple of years ago, and my daughter uh, at the time was eight years old, and she attended the seminar, and she's uh, it's just cute as can be, taking notes and just having a great time. And after the seminar, she begins asking me some questions. She said, Daddy, 
why can't we shoot off fireworks in our own yard? And I said, well, see, this time, I'm, I'm from Arizona, and at this time, uh, Arizona restricted fireworks 100%. No sparklers, no firecrackers, nothing. And so I said, well, government doesn't really think that we're responsible enough to, uh, uh, to have fireworks in our own yard. And so she said, but Daddy, you shoot off the big fireworks during Constitution Week. And she's right. Every September during Constitution Week, we have a big Constitution Week event in Gilbert, Arizona, and we shoot off these big Fourth of July-style fireworks. And I said, that's correct, but I have to go to government to get permission in order to shoot off those fireworks. And she said, but they give you permission, right? And I said, well, obviously, because we do it. And she said, so they give you permission to shoot off the big fireworks, but not the little ones in your own yard? <laughs> she said, yeah, it doesn't make much sense, does it? She said, no, no, not at all. So she begin, keeps asking me questions just like this. Daddy, why is government doing this? Why is government doing that? Finally, after a few minutes, out of frustration, this cute little eight-year-old girl said, why don't we just tell government to stop? <laughs> well, it'd be nice to be able to tell government to stop. But I said that they've uh, gotten a little bit too big and a little too powerful to just ask them to stop. She thought about that for a moment and said, oh, like a king. I said, exactly like a king. And then she said, oh, no, don't tell me we have to go through that again. <laughs> I said, well, what are you talking about? She said, oh, Revolutionary War and things like that. And so I was able to, to tell her that we've got these great tools that the Founding Fathers sacrificed and died for, for us to be able to petition our government with a redress of grievances in a peaceful manner, and that we have the opportunity to vote. That's a very powerful thing. Think about this for a minute. Every two years, we have the ability to replace our entire House of Representatives, every state legislature, right, and a third of the Senate. Every other two years, we replace the President, another third of the Senate, and the rest of boards and commissions and things like that. For the most part, we have, in, in two election cycles, we've replaced the entire government except for one third of the Senate, and we take care of them two years later. So in a six-year period, we can replace our entire government if we want to, if the people simply have the will to do so. That's a pretty powerful, powerful thing, the power to vote or the right to vote. Uh, very important to, to keep those things in mind. So here it is. We have this great opportunity to rise up uh, against the tyranny that we have in our country today by peaceful means because we understand these principles and because we, we uh, had this great sacrifice of the founders to restore those freedoms to us that, uh, that the Anglo-Saxons had lost hundreds of years ago. And my daughter, eight-year-old daughter, was able to figure it out. I think the rest of us can figure it out as well. So The 5,000 Year Leap, fantastic uh, book. So I highly recommend you getting that and, and making that part of your I Love America library. Uh, and uh, make sure you keep the dust off of it, keep it open, and read it quite often. Now, let's jump back into the book here. We, uh, we're on page eight. Now, the people who settled Plymouth were separatists or pilgrims. Okay, but the next group of people in 1623 were the Puritans. Now, what is the difference between the Puritans and the pilgrims? Puritans is your blank, by the way, under letter A, Roman numeral number four. What's the difference between the Puritans and the pilgrims? They didn't want to separate from the church people. That's right. The Puritans wanted to purify it, purify the Church of England rather than separate from the Church of England like the pilgrims did. Okay? So when they got to America, they decided, boy, they're going to they're gonna really make sure they purify this church, and they mixed their church with their government, and they created a theocracy. Now, these are the people that are famous for the Salem witch trials. So how did theocracy work out for them? Not, too good. Not, really. Not very well. Not very well at all for those who found themselves at the wrong end of the rope, right? And so they, uh, they, they had some struggles there. In fact, they became so harsh that they, uh, they banished from their communities a couple of very insignificant people. They're listed here in the bottom part of that paragraph in A, Anne Hutchinson, Roger Williams, Thomas Hooker. Now, these people, when they went, uh, they went and settled Connecticut and Rhode Island. And when they got there, they decided, you know, we really don't want to establish a theocracy. We, we saw what's, what happened as a result of that. And so they were trying to figure out how can we establish a better government. Thomas Hooker had some good ideas. And uh, Hooker is your next blank under letter B. And what he did was he thought, you know, we we've, we've already have some things written down, Magna Carta and stuff like that. And uh, 
those helped a little bit, but not all that well, because all those were is a listing of rights. And then they were, the government was simply told, don't abuse these rights. So he thought, you know, we need to put a little bit more constraints ar around government. We need to have an actual structure of government that protects those rights. And so that's exactly what he did, is he wrote uh, the Constitution for Connecticut, which is called the Fundamental Orders of Connecticut. And it became the first written, which is your next blank, the first written constitution in America, actually in modern times. And with this type of constitution, where it really puts government within a, a framework, um, I believe that it's actually the first one of its kind in the history of the world. Um, there's a couple other constitutions out there, but, uh, but, but this one is very unique. And so Thomas Hooker put this, this together. And do you know where he got many of his good ideas? From the first chapter of the book of Deuteronomy. You know, you've heard some people say that the, the Constitution comes from the Bible. Well, the, the U.S. Constitution doesn't. It, it comes from all these principles that the founders discovered, and some of them they discovered in the Bible. Um, but this is where this idea comes from, that our Constitution came from the Bible, is that some of those early Constitutions did, uh, and they kind of end up evolving into our Constitution today. So the first chapter of the book of Deut Deuteronomy. Why Deuteronomy? Uh, well, first of all, I don't know when the last time any of you read the Old Testament, but the book of Deuteronomy is just about as dry as the rest <laughs> of the Old Testament. <clears throat> and so when you go and read it, you're wondering why. But once you learn these principles, you go back and read it, and it comes alive. Um, basically, it's, it's uh, the government established under the direction of Moses, and it's a representative form of government. And so that's really what Thomas Hooker grabbed a hold of, is this representative form where you divide and subdivide. And uh, a little bit later on, we're going to go into detail about the Israelites and what their form of government was, which kind of gives you an idea of what Thomas Hooker discovered. Um, but yeah, that's why Deuteronomy. So once you learn these principles, go back and read it. It'll be exciting because the Old Testament won't be quite as boring and dry as it has been in the past for you. So a little bit more exciting. So Thomas Hooker put this in place, and it became that first written constitution. Now, how many countries are there in the world today, approximately? Yeah, around 200 is what we usually say, because it varies, you know, fluctuates, depends on who's at war with who and whatever. Uh, about 200. Any idea how many written constitutions are in the world today? 37. 37. Any other, any other guesses? One. Two. One. Okay. Well, as of about 15 or 20 years ago, there were 125. And now I know that there's a lot more than that. I don't know exactly what the number is. But the point is we know that there's at least 125 out of 200. That's pretty remarkable. Out of 125 constitutions, whose is the oldest? Ours. Ours is. Now that's amazing because we are among the youngest in the family of nations. But yet we have the oldest written constitution. You see what Thomas Hooker got going on here? It's kind of a, this interesting trend. Now, some constitutions are better than others in the world, but he started this idea that the people have the right to tell the government what their boundaries are. And that simple concept has done more to free the mind of man and, and free the property of man and, and, and basically bring freedom to the entire world more than any other concept. Because now people all over the world can say, the power to govern resides here. And while we do need government so that we can figure out how to work together as a society, that government is limited within this framework. What a, what a brilliant concept Thomas Hooker uh, documented and put down on paper. And so America has become uh, a great example to the rest of the world. In fact, you'll see here on the top of page 9, the English colonists came to America with a sense of a divine mission. Mission is your blank. Or a manifest destiny. Now, we hesitate to use that term, manifest destiny, because it was abused through the 1800s. It was the excuse to, to plow over the American <laughs> Indians. When the founders used this phrase, though, they were not referring to that. They did believe that we would one day cover the land from sea to shining sea. But, um, but what they were talking about is, is our principles of government being an example to the rest of the world. And that became uh, this divine mission or manifest destiny. And this is the reason why. First of all, Professor Conrad Cherry under letter A said, the belief that America had been providentially chosen for a special destiny has deep roots in the American past. And there's a few reasons why they felt like we were positioned very well uh, to be able to be a good example to the world. First of all, geographically, which is your blank for letter B, 
The founders felt that their commonwealth of freedom would eventually cover the whole of North America. Right? Geography. So they did believe that we'd go from north to south, east to west. And they, did, uh, they actually were hoping that we'd, we'd have Canada as well. We lost Canada in, in 1776. And uh, they were disappointed in that. They kind of always thought Canada would be part of the nation. But nevertheless, um, they felt like we'd cover this whole. And, and what an incredible nation that we have as far as resources and diverse landscape. And just it's just an amazing uh, place. And then letter C, as far as population, population your blank, was concerned. John Adams said that they were building a constitution and a system of government which would one day serve a population between 200 and 300 million freemen. Now, what's our population today? 300. 300 million, right? So here it is, John Adams. You know, have you ever heard that people say, oh, the Constitution doesn't apply to today. It was written for an 18th century agrarian society and doesn't apply? Many times. Many times. When you hear that, I want you to ask one question. Which part, which part doesn't apply to today? <laughs> there is no part. And the reason why there is no part is because the Constitution was written based on human nature, natural law. Human nature and natural law, they do not change. They are eternal and unchanging. So they just keep going. And so the Constitution was based on that. So there is no part. Uh, well, there is one very small part, but I'm going to leave that as a cliffhanger for you, and we'll talk about that a little bit later uh, that doesn't apply to today. But, but the basic structure of the Constitution absolutely continues to apply to today. And they say, well, the Founding Fathers, they couldn't have possibly known our problems that we're experiencing today. Mankind has had the same problems regardless of whether we have an iPhone in our pocket or not, right? And so things do not change with human nature. John Adams knew that we would one day have this huge population. In fact, interestingly enough, when we say, well, we had all this technology and, and so the Founders can't can't understand that. You know that uh, Benjamin Franklin had this great prediction. He was studying weather patterns and he realized, you know, as he's writing to friends in other parts of the colonies and they'll, they're talking about storms that they had on such and such a date and he had a big storm at, uh, at a particular date in Philadelphia, he realized that it's the same storm a day or two later. And he discovered, wow, the weather moves and it, and it, uh, and it, and it and so he, he thought, you know, one day, he said, I think that mankind will be able to communicate instantaneously using the weather or other unseen forces in nature. Isn't that a great prediction? You know, these cell phones that we have on our side, are these some magical, mystical thing that mankind has created out of nowhere? No. All we're doing is we're using an unseen force in nature to communicate instantaneously exactly as Benjamin Franklin had predicted. So they understood they understood where we'd be. They went through a technological advancement that, that was just as rapid as ours today. Uh, in their time, they, they saw amaz amazing advancements. And so it's important to understand that, that the founders understood uh, exactly what to expect, and they understood human nature and how humans react to certain things. And so that's exactly how they wrote the Constitution, based on uh, that human nature. So population, they knew that we'd be able to cover it. In fact, one evidence that they knew that we would have a large population is the Constitution itself. The Constitution is a republic. It's a republican form of government. Had they felt like we were always going to be, you know, just a few million people, then they would have put a lot more uh, tenets of democracy into the document. Uh, as it stands, we only have a few items of democracy. They would have put a lot more uh, because you can govern at a lower level with democracy reasonably well. But once you get big, and if you want to continue to expand indefinitely, a democracy fails every time. And so that's why they established a republic. Now, letter D, the founders did not consider themselves a master race, but rather as master servants who had an obligation to the creator to be an example to the world. So servants is your blank for letter D. And this is a great, great quote from John Adams. I always consider the settlement of America with reverence and wonder, as the opening of a grand scene and design in Providence for the illumination of the ignorant and the emancipation of the slavish part of mankind all over the earth. So it's for everybody. This is not just an American thing. Americans don't 
just own these 28 fundamental principles of liberty and the principles that are in the Constitution. They believed that this, these are natural law principles, that they were inspired to come up with many of them, or to discover many of them, I should say, and that uh, their purpose was to be an example to the rest of the world to free the mind of man all over the world. And so what a fantastic story that we have in the settling of America and some of the challenges that they went through in this 180-year period uh, between, uh, between Jamestown and that Constitution. And some of the stuff that we also learned with that quick history of England about how we have to write things down and how we have to protect our freedoms at all times. And so that concludes the settling uh, of America with, with uh, lesson number one, and we'll pick it up with lesson number two, Birth of a Nation.